Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another episode of Indie Game Friday, where I take a look at independent role-playing games. This week, we're going to take a look at one I very nearly glossed over, but I'm glad I didn't. The Stormguard, Darkness is Coming. Developed and published by Bitman Studios, it was released on Steam on August 25th, 2016, but was apparently available prior to that in early access. Its current price is sitting at $19.99 US. The Stormguard is a turn-based roguelike tactical combat and pa party management RPG that has strong hints of darkest dungeons throughout. In fact, that comparison will come up again and again. While not focused on the psychological aspect of that game, it does have the grueling difficulty level at times, as well as permadeath for individual characters on the team and resource management. The town also has various buildings that provide upgrades or tasks for characters to do. The storyline is somewhat inspired by the Night's Watch organization in Game of Thrones. Basically, a thousand years past, a great dragon appeared and brought a plague of monsters and darkness upon the land. The Storm Guard was formed to destroy the creatures the dragon brought with it, and eventually put the dragon down. Now, a thousand years later, after the Storm Guard is weakened and grown complacent, another dragon has appeared. The story is set up through an animated cutscene which admittedly would not have been out of place graphically a decade or so ago. Still, it's nice to have, tells the story well, and could actually give a shot of nostalgia to those who played RPGs back then. In terms of gameplay, there are three main segments. The Keep, which you can give a name to, has interfaces where your characters prepare for the hardships to come, rest and recover, recruit allies, or engage in tasks during downtime. The mission screen consists of an abstract map of linked squares, again similar to the lower map in the Darkest Dungeon game. This one, however, is full screen and is the main method of navigating through an adventure. Finally, there's the combat screen, which is a 3D view of a set piece or room on which the characters move and fight. While the exploration is more ab abstract than the Darkest Dungeon, the combat itself is more in-depth, with various skills and consumables on top of a proper tactical map with movement, obstacles, zones of control, and range, and so forth and so on. In the keep, each turn is considered a day. For the first few days, a few buildings are opened up for use at a time, gradually increasing the player's options. There is the mission board, which allows the player to assemble a party from the roster and select a mission to go on. The tavern, where the player can recruit soldiers and heroes. The sanctuary, where characters may rest between missions. The shop, where the player can purchase supplies like food, potions, and so forth. The Training Hall, where heroes can gain new skills or upgrade new ones. The Armory, where heroes can upgrade their equipment. The Graveyard, where the player can reflect on fallen characters. And the Steward's Office, where characters can be set to perform useful tasks during downtime. The Keep itself has a panic level, which may go up based on certain factors, like ongoing uncompleted missions, and down when a mission is completed. The panic level affects how much gold the keep brings in each turn. On each turn, as much preparation may be taken as necessary, but the day ends when you go on a mission, which is presumed to take the rest of the day. You may also skip a day, which may be useful if you are too short on useful characters or gold to properly prepare for a mission. This is actually more useful because of the steward's office options. Some of the tasks therein can earn food and gold, so if you've had a hard time or are down to just one character, that character could theoretically try to do something useful while you're waiting for the keep to generate enough to outfit an entire team. One thing to consider is that your roster is very limited. It can hold a few parties worth of characters, but not much more than that. The character classes are pretty diverse, but another thing to keep in mind is the difference between heroes and soldiers. Soldiers cover the whole, ra the whole gamut that heroes do, but they can't upgrade their skills or equipment. They're much cheaper than heroes and useful for filler, however. Heroes, on the other hand, despite being much more expensive to hire, upgrade, and equip, are just all around better. Each character has a stamina bar, and going on missions or taking certain actions knocks off a certain amount of stamina each day, making the occasional rest in the sanctuary mandatory. 
When you embark on a mission, you may select up to three characters to form the party. This is a very, very tight party and can make selecting a survivable group challenging at times. Still, certain missions will allow you to rescue other characters, which may be added to your party for the duration of the mission and then to your roster when you get back to town. The mission map is, as stated above, a series of linked squares. Movement is accomplished through a directional or a WASD keys, and each step costs the party one food, meaning that on larger maps, you'd best carry quite a bit, especially if you have to double back. Failure to have enough food will result in starvation with each step, which will degrade your health over time. Each step into an unexplored map square also triggers an event. These events are done in a choose-your-own-adventure style way, where you are given a text description of what is going on and certain options to choose from. Having certain types of characters in your party may unlock alternate options in some encounters. This can give you the opportunity to gain resources for free, purchase items or skills at reduced cost, gain new party members, or avoid combat entirely. And the latter is not a bad thing. True to an old school type of flavor, Sometimes fighting in every enemy that comes up is not your best option, and reserving your strength for the goal of the mission itself is the better choice. Still, there will inevitably come a time when combat does start. Combat switches to a 3D overhead view of the combat area or set piece, which is fundamentally laid out on a grid. Each team takes its own turn, with the individual characters taking their turns within their team's turn in whatever order they want. Each character may move once and use a skill. If they don't move, they might be able to use more than one skill or attack with a basic attack more than once. All characters can access the group's potion stat wherever they are on the field, so the individual characters don't have to carry them with them. Combat includes ranged attacks, melee, zone of control, which allows melee characters to effectively engage those around them, things like attacks of opportunity if a foe attempts to move out of the zone of control, and generally a whole gamut of options available to a more well-rounded game. Characters who die in combat are removed entirely from your roster, and retreat can be difficult to impossible to execute once combat is engaged. The variety and severity of conditions skills can inflict can mean that combats can be quite deadly, and there will likely be a fair turnover of characters during a particular game, especially in the early parts. Musically, the game utilizes a variety of rather well-known royalty-free tracks, which can't be faulted for that much, though if you've played a lot of indie games lately or watched a lot of YouTube videos and that sort of thing, you'll doubtlessly recognize more than a few. Aside from this nitpick, the sound choices are appropriate and don't detract from the game's atmosphere at all. Graphically, the three game's 3D portion isn't anything special, but it's not ugly or possessed of a polarizing cartoonish style. Rather, it uses a muted set of models and textures that wouldn't have been out of place in an old Neverwinter's Night mod. The interface is where it all falls apart. It's useful, it gets the job done, but it just seems like the ugliest part of the entire presentation. A little more polish on the interface could go a long way. There is a narrator that talks to you through the story, reading the storyline and introducing some fights. If you face an enemy you haven't before, the narrator will give a little introduction and warning based on that creature's abilities. It's a nice touch, and the voice acting isn't bad, though the audio quality could use some work. Also, the writing, while pretty decent in most places, can get a touch awkward from time to time. Overall, this game's similarities with Darkest Dungeon are solid when they occur, and the differences are not to its detriment. I'm actually rather impressed with the game as a whole, although it definitely could use a bit more spit shine on the presentation. I'm just not sure if I'm $19.99 impressed. I mean, yeah, it may sound a little entitled of me since that's not all that bad a price, but I'm just not sure the quality is quite there yet. I personally would have liked to have seen this sitting at $14.99 or $17.99, but now I'm just kind of splitting hairs. If you like Darkest Dungeon, or you like a tactical party-style roguelike, then the Storm Guard Darkness and Coming will not do you wrong even at the $19.99 price range. I'll leave it at that. As always, links in the description below. This has been the RPG Crawler for Indie Game Friday. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you have feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content. 
Until next time, take care and goodbye.